you know, we're out here in the woods. Hello there, welcome back to my vlog. This is Jay Vlog, and I'm back. And as you can see, we are somewhere else. We are at a different location. We're outdoors. We're up north in Sweden. We're at a place called Sunansjö. There's a lake down there. It's called Sunansjö. And if you take the car and you drive like 10 minutes in that direction, you get to Nordmaling. And this is all in Västerbotten, in the northern part of Sweden. We're here, man, and it's summertime. The sun is shining. It is hot outside. And it's a fitting environment to talk about this year's Wimbledon for so many reasons. And we're going to talk about the Wimbledon tournament 2019 in tennis. It's referred to as the championships, if you talk to a British person, that is. And first, let's give a standing ovation and a big congratulations to the latest champion, Simona Halep from Romania. Yeah. And also a big congratulation and standing ovation to the men's champion Novak Djokovic from Serbia. Congratulations to the both of you. Out of the four Grand Slams in tennis, the Wimbledon tournament, I have to say, is my favorite one. It's the one with the most history, it's the one that is most respected, it's the one that I have the most memories of as a kid growing up. I was born in 1975 uh, and my memories growing up in the 80s was that on Swedish television they always showed uh, the Wimbledon finals and semi-finals, uh, maybe the quarters, I don't, I don't remember, and I also remember that they were airing the Roland Garros but not the other two Grand Slams I don't remember that maybe they did but the one that I remember most fondly are Wimbledon and it's so fitting that we are right here because it was at this grass lawn that I myself played tennis every summer growing up in the 80s uh, with my friend here we had so much fun even when it was raining we used to play and the surface is not straight, as you can see. So the, the player that had the other half court had always a big advantage against the one that had the other half court. And the guy I played against was three years older, so uh, usually he beat me. Not always, but most of the time. And as you know, Wimbledon is played on grass. It's the only Grand Slam that is played on grass. It's not that many tournaments that is being played on grass. It's a short season. Grass is the least common surface in tennis, generally. And it's so fitting that we are here. Not only that I played here on grass as a kid, just for fun, but it was here, at this house here, uh, that I always watched Wimbledon growing up in the 80s. Uh, I always watched the finals. It was like a big event every year, every summer that I was here. Uh, it was something that you always look forward to. And if I can just mention two fond memories that I have of Wimbledon growing up, it would be the, one, the first one in 1984 uh, when John McEnroe uh, won his third Wimbledon title and he was utterly destroying his rival from the United States, Jimmy Connors, uh, three sets to love and he crushed him. It was three of the most easy sets he has ever won, John McEnroe. And he just played with him. And that was so memorable because it was a toss up from the beginning. Uh, no one knew who would win. And it was a rematch from 82 
when Connors actually won a hard four five cent match that took a long time to play. So uh, that was very surprising the way McEnroe won and I will always remember that. It's regarded as McEnroe's finest hour actually. And the other fond memories I have is from 1987, three years later, when Pat Cash from Australia won his only Wimbledon title, which was his uh, lifelong dream. But the thing that I remember most is uh, the man he beat in the finals, which was Ivan Lendl from Czechoslovakia, as it was called then. Uh, he also had a lifelong dream of win winning Wimbledon. It was the only Grand Slam he hadn't won uh, because he was a clay court specialist, but he, he, was, he was beaten by Pat Cash in three straight sets. He, hadn't, he didn't have like a chance really. So I, I kind of felt for Lendl because I knew it was like his last chance to win a Wimbledon. But he didn't capitalize on it. So those two are my strongest memories. And of course we have the Swede Stefan Edberg who won a couple of Wimbledons. And that was great also. Alright, but enough about memory lane. Let's talk about this year's 2019 Wimbledon or the championships if you want to be British and call it that all right let's first talk about the women the ladies and let's talk about this year's champion the winner of it all Simona Halep from Romania a big congratulations to her it's the first time she won Wimbledon it's the second time she won a Grand Slam she won Roland Garros last year 2018 uh, she has been in several finals in Grand Slams and uh, she was kind of known for losing most of them she like I said she only won one uh, so a lot of people were betting against her in the final because she was facing none other than the living legend of tennis Serena Williams from the United States who had not played a lot of tournaments since coming back from giving birth and she has had bad results in those tournaments uh, she lost already in the third round in the Roland Garros and uh, her complaint was that she didn't have a lot of matches but she had looked very good in this year's Wimbledon coming up to the finals and as you know Wimbledon is her favorite tournament uh, grass is a is a perfect surface for her uh, and she looked great for example Serena looked devastating in her semi-final versus 33 year old Barbara Strykova from the Czech Republic uh, who was a surprise that she went that far in the tournament uh, but like I said Serena looked good and most experts pick her to win and collect her 24th Grand Slam, which would have been a tie to uh, Margaret Court from Australia, who had the record at 24, but most of her wins has been in the pre-open era. Uh, but it was once again all set up for Serena to win, but not all picked Serena. There were some experts that picked Simona Halep. Uh, she had also beaten a lot of great players coming up to the final, like. Victoria Azarenka, uh, Corey Goff, the 15-year-old sensation, which I will be talking about later, uh, Elina Svitolina, and uh, it was geared up to be a great final. And uh, the thing with Simona Halep is that we all knew she is a clay court specialist, uh, but we didn't know that she could play this good on grass, and it was surprising for her too. But this is the greatest we have ever seen Simona Halep on grass and what happened in the final man it was lights out I don't use the word masterpiece that often I'm very careful with that but this was a masterpiece by Simona Halep she really beat Serena 6-2 6-2 it was devastating she played a flawless match throughout Halep and it was so great because it was on grass and it was against Serena Williams 
so she couldn't have asked for a bigger name and a bigger stage to show that Halep is all around a great player not just on clay but also on grass and why not because she's so fast she should be great on grass but it was the first time we saw this uh, she's like I said she's 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 a short player uh, so she has trouble with high balls but she's so fast around the court she's the fastest female player in the world uh, she runs all over the place she can take every ball and uh, she had a great work ethic and it was just great to see her win uh, I'm very happy for her I hope uh, it's gonna be again <laughs> Uh, it's not the only one match that I played great. Uh, I, in my opinion, I played many great matches, even if I lost a few of them. Um, I feel uh, that I'm at the highest level for sure, but I'm feeling also that I can improve some things. Not about today's match, but uh, this tournament, I feel like uh, I have to improve other things and I will keep working for that. I'm still motivated and uh, I'm looking forward already to the next tournaments and next uh, challenges that I have. At the same time, my big idol is Serena Williams, so uh, it was kind of emotional not to see her win this time either. It seems that she has so much trouble now getting that last 24th Grand Slam with so many people are longing for her to win, including herself, I think, even though she won't admit it. She says she's not thinking about it, but I think she must. Uh, and it also seems that Serena has a hard time winning finals, period. Because I don't know if it's the 24th thing that is like a ghost, but for her, like a mental thing. But uh, it seems to me that, uh, well, she has had trouble winning finals and Grand Slams lately. But uh, we'll see what happens with her. She must win sometimes, otherwise it would be very disappointing, I think. I don't really, you know, someone told me um, I shouldn't look at the records anymore and I should just focus on my game and that's kind of been what I've been doing since I got to 18. Um, in the meantime, I had got pregnant and had a baby and, you know, so that definitely plays a little bit into it, but... Um, I don't know. I feel like I'm just really on this journey of just doing the best that I can and um, playing the best that I can when I can. But when we talk about the latest, I think the face of this tournament, when all is said and done, was the 15-year-old sensation Corey Goff from the United States of America. A lot of people didn't think she was going to win a match, period. But she went all the way to the fourth round when she was eventually beaten by Simona Halep but especially the first match was a big one because she faced none other than her idol well one of her idols uh, Venus Williams which is 39 years old and she was only 15 so it was a, a it was really a, a match of the generations she wasn't even born when Venus won her first four Grand Slams it was a match that everyone wanted to see. And Goff played so good and so mature, it was great to see. And I think she was really the story of the latest tournament. She prefers to be called by her nickname Coco. And she was actually given a wild card to this year's Wimbledon. But what was most striking about her was that she was unbelievable great with the media. She really came across as a genuine, bubbling 15 year old kid and that was so charming Coco um, speaking of your mom and mm -hmm. being focused um, she's going a little bit viral back home in the states <laughs> oh, um, no. based off her chest pumping and uh, going nuts but uh, so please talk tell me she's a meme <laughs> <laughs> she's got, she did really hard oh, no. sure. I'm so excited it's to go to Instagram <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> um, actually, all my friends were texting me. They were like, and I, oop, and I was like, I mean, that was the reaction I got. Um, but like I said before, like, I kind of knew it was coming. But still, like, you know, you're still shocked when you play your hero first round. 
Oof. Um, I think, well, this was the last time I cried, but before then, oh, um, <laughs> actually the movie Endgame when Iron Man <laughs> died, um, I was crying and I like, every time I think of it, I get tear teary eyed because I really liked Iron Man. <laughs> And a lot of comparisons were made between her and Serena Williams, uh, mostly because I think she's Afro-American, and they are both being trained by Patrick Morutoglu, uh, the very well-known French trainer who has an academy and is often seen on uh, interviews and uh, television programs. I think if you should compare it to someone, it should be like. Well, if you're going to choose one of the Williams, it should be Venus, because I think her body type is more like Venus. But I think the one that you really should compare her to is uh, Jennifer uh, Capriati, who also bust onto the scene at 15 years old in the early 90s. And a lot of people is saying, like, oh my god, we, get, we have a new superstar here. Uh, she plays this good at 15. Think what she can do when she's like 25. But uh, a little warning here because uh, the trend has been that 15 year old who gets success fast, they had a tendency to burn out real quick. So a warning to that, that could happen. So it's not an automatic thing that she will be a living legend uh, or, some, or a hall of famer. But I wish so. And it was, uh, it was great to see her play and a breath of fresh air, I think. All right, I'm gonna talk about some of the upsets on the women's side. And one that was a, a real upset for me and a lot of people was that the Roland Garros champion, Ashley Barty from Australia, which a lot of people had so much hopes in. She lost already in the fourth round against Alison Risk from the United States. And that was a big surprise. Many people thought that uh, Barty will win Wimbledon, maybe even win the US Open, and because she had looked so great in the Roland Garros. That was a surprise. Maybe we had too much hope for her so soon. Another surprise, I have to say, was Naomi Osaka, the Japanese sensation, who got crushed out already in the opening round. And it's so sad because as you know, she struggled so much in the Roland Garros. Uh, she only won two matches there, which was a surprise because she had won both uh, the Australian Open and the US Open prior to that. And many thought that she was gonna maybe win a calendar slam or something like that. But uh, she has dipped now and uh, she's going through some mental things. I think it was too much pressure for her, uh, winning two slams that fast back to back and becoming number one so uh, she has taken a step back uh, so she has a lot of things to sort out mentally I think Has it been difficult to get used to the new level of fame that you have? You've pretty much become a global superstar over the last 12 months by winning in Australia and New York You have to leave So I feel like I'm about to I'm sorry, we have to leave that there. Thank you. But I hope she's going to bounce back. Uh, I'm sure she will. She got the game. She's young. Uh, and we want to see her do good things. She's very likable and popular. Two ladies that also went out in the first round was Garbin Muguruza from Spain. That was a surprising thing. And Maria Sharapova from Russia who actually retired in a match. She couldn't continue. And both Angelique Kerber and Madison Keys lost in the second round. Also a little surprising. Kerber really needs to rethink her career. Man, she has lost a lot lately. Some other things that happened here. Um, the hometown favorite, Johanna Conta from the United Kingdom. She lost in the quarterfinals and she was pissed off at the uh, press conference to a specific reporter. Yeah, I don't have much else to say to your question. I'm just asking you as somebody who presumably wants to go on from here, learn from this and, and win a Grand Slam one day. 
is it not something that you need? Please don't patronise me. I'm I, not I would have, no, no, you are. In, in the way you're I'm asking, your, in the way you're asking your question, you are being quite disrespectful, and you are patronising me. I'm a professional competitor who did her best today, and that's all there is to that. Let's move on to the next question, please. Just behind. So all in all, a great ladies' tournament. It was great to see Halep win. It was great to see the 15-year-old golf uh, bust into the scene. I hope we will see a lot of great things from her in the future. So, uh, that's that. Hello there. We are back here again. And uh, it's summertime. And right now, we are in what is called Sunanxue. This is the actual Sunanxue. And it's beautiful. It's hot outside, summertime. Northern Sweden, baby. This is north side. And now we're going to talk about the men in this uh, Wimbledon tournament called the Championships. And uh, a big congratulations once again to the amazing Novak Djokovic from Serbia, who barely won, but he did win this year's Wimbledon. And uh, that makes it 16 Grand Slam championships for uh, Djokovic and uh, that's amazing. He's uh, still collecting them and uh, as you may well know Nadal has 18 Grand Slams and Roger Federer has 20. So he's uh, creeping up on them uh, and that's like a big question right now. Who's gonna wind up with the most? majors and um, uh, he beat Roger Federer in the finals and it was a great final it was almost you can say it was a classic I think because uh, well there's a lot of classics now but it went to five sets and it was a battle back and forth I thought that the match was never gonna end it went on for a long time and uh, in this year's Wimbledon, they introduced a new rule, which I think was very good. Uh, they introduced a tie break in the fifth and final set. You might, you might, you might hear the wind blow every now and then. Some kids screaming here. Well, it's summertime, so it was great that they introduced this new rule because matches used to go on forever, especially when there was two big servers. But they didn't make the tiebreak at 6-all, like in most tournaments, and in the other sets, but at 12-all. So, uh, if it goes that long, then you have, uh, in reality, played 6, six, six sets. And, uh, and then there's a tiebreak. I think it's better than not having a time break at all because I think that the player who wins should win because he's the best player not just because the other guy is totally exhausted so the final against Federer wouldn't you believe in the fifth set they went all the way to 12 all so the first very first year in which they had this rule they they played until 12 all and we had a tie break in the fifth and final set and so there was a little controversy there because many people thought oh my god that's so typical we're here it's federal uh, versus uh, Djokovic uh, and the crowd want to see this uh, match just go on and on and they want to see a clear winner so uh, some people who may have thought that this was a great a rule maybe have second thoughts uh, but overall I think was good what happened was that in this particular final uh, Novak Djokovic was devastating and was unbeatable in tie breaks all three sets that Djokovic won he won in tie breaks uh, so uh, it benefited uh, Djokovic that there was a tiebreak in the fifth and final set but it was a very close match it could have gone either way and the thing is 
Federer had two match points in the fifth set and he didn't capitalize on any of them. Uh, Djokovic played good in those, uh, on those points. I have actually never seen Federer so sad after losing a tennis match like this one. And it's because of two reasons. The first one is, of course, the age factor. Uh, he's 37 years old and uh, he won't get these many uh, chances again and he knows that. It could in fact be the la his last chance and he knows this. That's the first reason and the other reason was he had two match points so he could have just put it away. He was so close and we, when you are that close it's much more bitter to lose of course and also even though Wimbledon is his best tournament Federer's it seems that when he meets Djokovic in the final in, at Wimbledon he has difficulties with him clearly it's hard to tell I don't know if losing 2-2-2 two, two and two feels better than this one at the end it actually doesn't matter you know to some extent you know uh, you might feel more Disappointed, sad, uh, over angry. I don't know what I feel right now. You know, I just feel like it's uh, um, such an incredible opportunity missed. I can't believe it, you know, but uh, it is what it is, you know. He had it much easier against Nadal in Wimbledon, which makes sense because uh, clay is uh, Nadal's favorite surface, of course. But Nadal is a pretty damn good grass player as well. And he beat. Rafael Nadal in the semi-finals and every time we get a Federer versus Nadal matchup in any Grand Slam it's a feast it's a joy for the public it's the most loved matchup and it's the greatest uh, it's the most loved rivalry in tennis on paper Nadal versus Djokovic is the biggest rivalry but the, the most loved rivalry is Federer versus Nadal and Federer beat Nadal 3-1 in sets in the semi-final uh, Djokovic beat uh, Batista Agut from Spain in the semi-final it was a surprise that Batista Agut went that far in the semi-finals uh, just one thing about uh, Novak Djokovic as a strictly tennis player, he has no weaknesses. He's all around. He's like a wall on the baseline. But the only weakness that Djokovic has, if you want to call it a weakness, is his mental struggles when the crowd is rooting and cheering on his opponent. And usually that is Federer or Nadal. Uh, there's a lot of talk about Djokovic that he has an obsession to be loved by the public which he hasn't really received um, Federer and Nadal is super loved all around the globe and they are I think the two most loved players of all time uh, and you can't compete with that you just can't Federer has the most beautiful most graceful playing style that's, that we have ever seen uh, plus he's good looking of course and Nadal is just the greatest warrior you have seen in sports I think or one of them uh, so you can't compete with that Djokovic he's just good that's his thing and uh, it's not that the public dislikes Djokovic uh, and I think that he gets this confused a lot of times. Uh, it's just that the public and the crowd just loves uh, Federer and Nadal more. And also if Djokovic is like up uh, two, two sets to, to love or two sets to one and the, his opponent is winning a set, uh, the crowd cheers because they want to see a longer match. And it doesn't have anything to do with they particularly dislike Djokovic. It's just that it's just that they want to see more tennis, and he gets it, he gets it confused a lot of times. 
but I must say that in the final against Federer, he uh, he handled himself very well uh, on the mental side. Uh, he didn't let the crowd get to him, and I think that was the reason why he ended up as the victor. <laughs> That's a good question because uh, you know at times you just try to ignore it, which is quite hard. I, I like to tra uh, you know transmutate it in a way. So when the crowd is chanting Roger, I, I hear Novak. So that's. <laughs> I know it's it's it sounds it sounds silly, but it is like that. I try to convince myself that it's like that. And is that like a mental training, or is that something you're doing with? Of course, yeah. of course. You've been, uh, you've been catching. Trying it's similar, Roger Novak. You know when. They're <laughs> So, so now the talk is who will end up with most Grand Slams. Uh, the one that, it's, that is most in a hurry is without a doubt Federer because he's the oldest of the big three. And um, then we have uh, Djokovic, he's a couple of years younger, so he has more time. And um, Djokovic is doing great on, in both Wimbledon and especially Australian Open. Uh, and then we have Nadal who can just chill and relax knowing the fact that he can always collect a couple of more, more Roland Garros uh, majors because he's the undisputed king there. So uh, Federer is the one who feels more stress. Uh, on the other side, he's, uh, he's ahead right now with 20 Grand Slam, but uh, the other ones, they have time to catch up. But I think emotionally, most people still think he's the greatest of all time. But we'll see what happens if, um, if the other, other guys catch up to him. We'll see what the public thinks. But I think when the day comes when Federer and Nadal retires, Djokovic is still going, then I think Djokovic may very well uh, be the most loved player. Maybe he will receive that love that, he, that he's looking for. But he has to wait until those guys retire. That might take a while. Well, it's, it seems like I'm getting closer, but also they're winning slams. So it's like, it's, you know, we're kind of complementing each other. And, and I guess the we're, we're making each other grow and and evolve and, and, and still be in this game. I think, I mean, those two guys, you know, probably one of the biggest reasons I still I still compete at this level. And I, and I that, that, you know, the fact that, that um, you know, they've made history of this sport motivates me as well, inspires me to, to, to try to do what they, what they've done, what they've achieved and even more. Um, whether I'm going to be able to do it or not, I don't know. I, I mean, I uh, I'm not really looking at uh, age as a restriction of any kind uh, for me, at least. I, I um, what I said on the court, I really meant it. I think you know, Ro you know, he, Roger really inspires me with his effort in at his age, and um, it just depends, you know, how long I'm going to play, whether I'm going to have a chance to, you know, make historic number one or slams. It depends not only on myself, it depends on circumstances in life. I'm, I'm not just a tennis player, I'm, I'm, I'm a father, I'm a husband, you know, and uh, you have to balance things out. Obviously, you need to have the right circumstances, the right support for things to play out in the right way. Uh, Roger, you have these two guys behind you who are trying to catch you in the all-time list of slam wins. You have many records, this is one of them. For you, is that is that element of the sport uh, exciting? Is it irrelevant? Is it stressful? Well, I mean, it used used to be a, a really really big deal, you know. I guess when you were close, you know, um, I guess two behind, and then eventually you tie, um, then ev eventually you break. So that was big, you know. It's been different since, you know, naturally because. Um, you know the chase is in a different place, and I take uh, motivation from different places. You know, uh, 
um, not so much from trying to stay ahead, you know, because I broke the record and if somebody else does, well, that's great for them and uh, you can't protect everything anyway and I was not, I didn't become a tennis player for that. I really didn't, you know, it's about trying to win Wimbledon, trying to have good runs here, you know, playing in front of such an amazing crowd and in front of, uh, in this center court against players like Novak and so forth, you know, that's what I play for. So, uh, um, yeah, so things are different now, but uh, I'm very happy that with my level of play nowadays still. We spoke about that <laughs> 1,000 times, so... Uh, <laughs> Is is at the same time is is great to be part of this uh, rivalry, be be in the middle of uh, these three players, uh, you know, that achieved that much in in this sport in in the same era is something that gonna be difficult to to see it again. But we we are not done, <laughs> so uh, things continue and um, just uh, have been another episode this afternoon. I think uh, Federer was very sad that he lost, but uh, he's aiming for the Olympic Games uh, next year, because he has never won a gold medal. So that will like make his career complete. But we'll see what happens. But the most exciting match in the whole tournament, on the men's side, in my opinion, and I think many opinions, was the second round match between Rafael Nadal and Nick Kyrgios from Australia, the bad boy of tennis. And it's a guilty pleasure, but I like to see him more than anyone else, I think. And I know a lot of fans agree with me. Every time he plays, you never know what's gonna happen. And uh, if that wasn't enough, he's, a, he's so talented. Uh, he can do so many cool shots, and great, great plays. But his biggest weakness is, of course, a lack of love for the sport, which he admits, and a lack, lack of focus, and a lack of discipline. But usually he turns it on when he plays at uh, center court on the big stage against a big-name opponent, which he did against Nadal, and everything happened in that match. Ooh. I get some fishes. I feel fishes on my uh, legs here. Well, uh, Kyrgios, he did like two underarm serves. Uh, he played behind his legs. He made some crazy drop shots. Uh, he's always talking to himself uh, between points. And it's not nice things that he says. And he always fights with the uh, umpire. Almost, almost every time especially when it doesn't go his way on the court. So he had a big fight with the umpire because he thought Nadal took too much long time between points when Kyrgios was serving. And, and also there was a lot of talk about the fact that Kyrgios the day before uh, went to the local pub and had a couple of beers uh, just the day before he was going to face Nadal on center court in Wimbledon. So. Uh, He's a very unorthodox in that way, uh, but uh, he has admitted that he doesn't love tennis. He has admitted that his biggest love is basketball, but he's not as good at basketball as he is in tennis. And he makes more money playing tennis, and he's more famous playing tennis, so uh, naturally he chooses that uh, sport. And of course, he doesn't have to love the sport or the uh, job that he's doing. There's a lot of people out there who doesn't love the job that they're doing. Uh, but as there are a lot of fans who find it very provocative that someone who is so talented so, and so good doesn't like uh, the sport that he's doing. And he doesn't have a coach and he's very, uh, he treats the sports in, very, in a very relaxed way. I'm a great tennis player, but I don't do the other stuff. You know, I'm not the most professional guy. I won't train day in, day out. I won't show up every day. So there's a lot of things I need to improve on to get to that level that, you know, Rafa brings, Novak brings, Roger have been doing for so long. Um, so it just depends how bad I want it. But no, at the moment, I don't think I can contend for a Grand Slam. 
and I know that I know that I'm capable. Like I know that I can bring a level. You know, I I haven't put in enough hours. I probably haven't trained enough. I don't have a coach. I don't haven't been doing enough gym, and I'm still go out there today and able to bring a level that you know can compete with one of the world's best and have chances to win the match. So I'm very confident when I'm on the court. Yeah, and maybe there are a couple of things I could do better, but yeah, I like I like the way I do things. Um, at the end of the day, it's tennis, man. Like, is it really that important? I mean, everyone here, like, obviously, yeah, but for me, it's not so important. And during this match, he was aiming at one time at Nadal's chest. He hit the ball so hard, he almost, it almost hit Nadal. And uh, Nadal got angry, and there's no love lost between those guys to begin with. Do you regret not apologizing for hitting him with the ball in the third Why would I apologize? Well, because that's the convention, isn't it? Of what? Of tennis. Is it? If you hit someone with the ball. I didn't hit him. He's racket, no? But why would I apologize? I won the point. He didn't look too pleased. And? What? But you, see, you, see, you seemed to wind him up and then he, you know, he then went I don't care. Well, why would I apologize? I mean, dude, dude's got how many slams? How much money in the bank account? I think he can take a ball to the chest, bro. I'm not gonna apologize to him at all. Did you aim it straight at him? Yeah, I, I actually was going like I was going for him. Yeah, I wanted to hit him square in the chest. Lucky's got decent hands. And there was a bird that just landed on the court, and uh, Curio started to sneeze at one point, like three times in a row. So like, everything was just happening. Everything happens with him. But. Uh, and he also beat Nadal five years ago at Wimbledon, which was a curious big breakthrough. So this was a rematch. But uh, Nadal is the better player, of course, so he won. But Curios tried to get into Nadal's head. And he succeeded for a while. And he's all, always uh, kind of feisty at reporters during press conferences after the after the matches uh, if there's a question that uh, is a little bit challenging to him he always reply in a very uh, feisty way or angry way so uh, he doesn't have like a great relationships with uh, reporters do you regret going to the pub last night do you think you could have played a bit better if you hadn't no you look way too excited to ask that question. You must have a really boring life. So you don't want it badly now? That's two questions in a row. Wait your turn. You're taking the piss. He literally just asked that three minutes ago. Like the exact same question. Right? Next question. Uh, what is your attitude? I mean, you uh, you enjoy our questions, so you I would, love them, bro. You would love uh, to go. <laughs> I love them. I love them. I, swear. Eh? I, I love them. I love them. You, you I love the media. Love like, I love doing the media. Yeah. 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 You guys are so nice to me. It's amazing. <laughs> like you guys are the best. Are you, you guys me don't are brainwash you, are you anyone. Me or are you no, I'm being serious. You guys don't brainwash anyone. It's always facts. Okay. Love it. <laughs> and now I'm going to talk a little, about, a little bit about upsets. Because unlike Roland Garros this year, there was quite a lot of upsets on the men's side. And uh, I will just give you right now five big names that all went out in the very first round. There was Alexander Sasha Sverre from Germany. Stefanos Tsitsipas from Greece, uh, Thomas Berdic from the Czech Republic, Grigor Dimitrov from Bulgaria, and Dominic Thiem from Austria. All those five guys went out in the very first opening round. So, but all in all, a great tournament. Uh, the public, of course, wanted to see Federer win. Uh, unfortunately for them, he did not. 
Djokovic is still. You can hear the birds in the back. Summertime, y'all. Djokovic is still the number one in the world. Supreme. No one is near him. And uh, I have um, I have a hint that uh, Djokovic will surpass these two other guys. But I don't like saying it. Because I want Federer to have the most when he's retired. And uh, Nadal to be second and Djokovic third. But we'll see what happens. But I love Wimbledon. It's a tournament that has so much history. And uh, I also love strawberries and uh, ice cream. So uh, maybe I will eat some myself after this uh, vlog just to get in the mood. But it was a great tournament. We'll see you next time in New York. I will not be there myself, but I will talk about the US Open, which is the fourth and final Grand Slam in the tennis world during a calendar year. So uh, I will go out and take a swim in this uh, beautiful uh, lake. Uh, we'll see if uh, Jason Voorhees will uh, jump up from a boat here like he did in the first movie Friday the 13th uh, but it's a great weather it's about 30 uh, Celsius it's hot outside it's summertime we're in Sunnansjö and we have uh, Nord Maling if you take the car and drive like 10 minutes in that direction and then if you drive like 30 minutes more we have Umeå a bigger city and uh, it's all belong to Västerbottens land in Sweden it's the northern part baby but it's warm I have a four week vacation this is my first week in my four week vacation and it's gonna be great there's no clouds in the sky it's gonna be great I'm gonna be here for like four days more and uh, my father was born here and uh, his father and uh, there's a lot of cows here and animals roosters horses and uh, actually I played some tennis here twice since coming here it's an outdoor uh, court hard court so I played against a friend here who lives here who used to live here who lives so I played against a friend who lives in New Malling who grew up here right here we have a boat a nice boat and it's a beautiful lake uh, called Sennachua Some very nice trees here, some nice houses, and uh, now I'm gonna go for a swim. And speaking of weather, the weather was great at Wimbledon for the whole two weeks. No rain delays. Uh, they have a roof in center court, but they, they didn't have to use it. So I'm just gonna uh, I'm just gonna take a walk I think but I guess I'll see y'all thanks for this year thanks for Wimbledon this year I'm gonna take a walk outside now all right peace see y'all play some more tennis this summer
And now all you listeners, you can hear the sound of a tractor coming up behind me. Summer, summer, summer. 